Hello, everybody. Welcome to Endoscopy Talks. I'm Dave Tweed from Colorado State University, and I want to thank you for joining us on behalf of Colorado State University's Translational Medicine Institute. So today, we're joined by a good friend of mine, Dr. Brendan McKiernan. Dr. McKiernan is currently Professor Emeritus in the Department of Veterinary Clinical Medicine at the University of Illinois. He graduated from the University of Minnesota, entered an internship and residency at the University of Illinois. Then he served on the faculty there for 25 years. He then went into private practice for 13 years and then returned to the University of Illinois as director of the Veterinary Teaching Hospital. He's the founder and first president of the Comparative Respiratory Society. He's published extensively on respiratory disease and has lectured nationally and internationally. He's considered one of the world's experts in small animal respiratory disease. And his big interest, I think, today is brachycephalic dogs and cats. Dr. McKiernan will present his webinar on endoscopic evaluation of the larynx. And with that, Brendan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, great. Good evening, everybody. Tonight's goal, uh, really not so much specifically on brachycephalics, but more importantly on the larynx of which brachycephalics have plenty of problems and some of that I'll show. But tonight's goal is to be able to look at a larynx and understand what we're looking at on three different images here and knowing what you're seeing, why you're looking at it, how to look at it and so forth. So the basics to get you up to speed and the problems that I've encountered on trying to help others. So let's try to do that. First uh, is going to be a difference in the area under the curve that I call it, that you can see here. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. But let's look at what the function of the larynx, which is where we're focused tonight. Uh, obviously, voice production, meowing, barking, talking, airway protection, so we don't choke on stuff, lower airway entry point, so the maximal resistance, 50 to 70% of the total lung resistance is in the upper airways larynx plus the nose. So it's a significant part. And that's one of the problems that we'll run into when we see dysfunction in the larynx. Okay. So we're talking about that. I've got a quick poll right away to see if you're awake. So we're going to put up three questions here. If you'd help us out and go ahead and do that. Uh, there they are. So have you ever done a laryngoscopy on a case yourself? Are you a boarded person of any type, board certified or just a specialty type people? And have you actually intubated a person, not a person, an animal before? So very quickly, give you maybe 20 seconds to click on the buttons there on your screens and we'll see the results just out of curiosity. Dave, can you count to 30? I know you can count backwards from 30. We'll just try to see if we can get it here. and we're not seeing any results. They pop up, there they are. So we've got uh, board certified people, about two thirds, about 70% of people, 73 have done laryngoscopy and nobody, very few people have not intubated a patient. The reason I put that up very quickly, uh, we can get rid of that, uh, is a, gave a talk last year and I asked uh, these kinds of things of people. And what I got was a 6% uh, had done laryngoscopy. Uh, so we're a lot better start off here. Uh, the question is going to be is when you looked at that larynx, were they normal? We got the bell curve up here. And I know all of you as experts out here, way up to the top are really great. But the question is, is the disease normal or not, typical or not? Did it read the books, do what it's supposed to? Do you have the best equipment out there to be able to document it and share it? And have you done a lot that you really feel experienced and you're not having much question about it? So everybody almost has intubated a patient. So you have looked at a larynx. And the question is, can I help you look at it a little bit more in detail, okay? So let's go from there. So we don't ask ourselves, really, did we miss something in looking at that larynx? Does somebody ask us a question later? Did you see this or that or the next thing? We're gonna cover that. Looking at an older uh, article here, this is in the Australian Veterinary Journal, but from actually New Zealand, 
a series of, I think it was 250 dogs, and they graded these as zero up to four, so five categories. And I just highlighted what they were found, what they found here. So normal was grade zero, but then one to four was increasing degree of your problems. Paresis is the title, but paralysis. And I think if you would agree that the bottom three, probably the bottom four, are what we would call actually paralysis now, and not just a weakness, a subtlety or something, but actually paralysis. Grades two, three, and four here are certainly I don't think anyone would disagree, is really laryngeal paralysis. So it was 250 dogs, about 25% of them. So out of that 250, 62.5 dogs, I'm not sure what that one looked like, had some degree of paresis. But again, most of them seem to be paralysis based on their scale. Overweight dogs uh, and older dogs had an increased incidence and labs and rodies we know about. The take home from here is that this is without any stimulation. This is just putting the dogs down under anesthesia, looking at what it is before they're intubated and categorizing it on that one to five or zero to four scale without any dopram, okay? So we didn't do any stimulation. The take home is that paresis or paralysis is much more common based on this study than maybe any of us thought before seeing this, okay? So how about the diagnostics? The first thing is really spending a little bit of time. I know time's money, but we're looking for dysfunction complaints. Exercise intolerance. The dog should be walking out there in front of you, pulling you along. That's, that was last year. Now maybe he's walking behind you, taking a break, stopping. That's significant. We'll talk about that in a second, about taking a walk test. Coughing or gagging, and then knowing which of those comes first as far as laryngeal disease. Cough, 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 gag, retch to me is lower airway disease most of the time. Gagging and then coughing, choking, means that you have a laryngeal dysfunction. So I drink water and choke on it. Uh, it's most likely going to be that I swallowed some, inhaled some. Voice change or purring. Purring probably more in cats has been reported. Voice change, everybody talks about, oh, he has a good bark. That does not mean that he does not have this kind of problem. So walk test, look at the Europeans here. This is the Finnish club. They are now stratifying the brachycephalics, having a one to four scale. And the top two are the better dogs able to walk, are certified, if you will, as being okay. And the bottom two are not. And other countries are starting to do the same. The US is way behind as usual on this. All right, let's talk about diagnostics again. On what are you going to find on your physical? Airflow obstruction, classically the strider, <coughs> trying to breathe like that when they come in the door, you hear them before they get up to the counter. But if you listen with your stethoscope, you're going to pick these things up earlier. And I'll have a slide that talks about that. On inspiration, you're going to hear this kind of wheezy sound, high pitch wheezy sound. On expiration, you may or may not have appreciated, there is a fluttering sound. I'll have a video and I'll have to make the sound when we see it. But the fluttering sound is the vocal cords, which are flaccid now, and on exhalation flutter, and they have a kind of a guttural sound, uh, uh, type of sound that occurs. And on inspiration, the high pitch uh, strider. You can check a gag reflex. Um, and a big dog, you should be able to put your hand into their throat and check to whether they gag readily or not. Many of these dogs kind of have a weak or maybe absent even gag reflex. That's why they might choke when they drink water. And then obviously we're gonna be palpating for any external mass that might be present. Looking at uh, brachycephalic, since Dave mentioned that, this was a uh, multiple different things that were looked at. I'm just gonna focus on the laryngeal auscultation after exercise. And after exercise, there was um, very good specificity. Uh, it was 100% specificity that they were able to uh, uh, document these things at, as abnormal by listening for the strider, okay? So we need to think about that. Additional diagnostics. Well, they're gonna be under anesthesia. So we need to know about maybe a lab base, whatever your clinic or hospital recommends or needs, or age of the animal. 
There are various imaging things we can talk about very briefly. Plain RADs of the larynx and trachea, CT, ultrasound, we'll mention those just in passing. And the endoscopy is the gold standard. That's the thing that we're gonna focus on. Maybe there's a contraindication in cats, maybe not. I put that in there because cats, in my experience at least, really kind of um, hide their degree of respiratory distress. And when you go to intubate them, you may find that the glottic opening is just about non-existent. So they seem to be able to breathe through that without getting in tremendous difficulty, but be prepared that they may take just a urinary catheter as opposed to a three or a 3.5 or something trach tube. The limitation is there's no sensory evaluation. You can feel your hands, you can move your fingers, you have good motor, you have sensation, the throat has sensation, but we have no way of testing that. If they're choking on eating or drinking, maybe that's in a crude evaluation or palpating back there to see if they seems to be normal or not. I'll refer you to this veterinary uh, key.com, veterinarian veteran key.com. A lot of nice diagrams. I'm not going to focus on those, but you can go there to look at them. So if you do have any questions popped up, uh, this is a friend that gave me one of his pictures. They took at the local pound, uh, local pond in Urbana. Dave, you got any questions posed up there? Uh, we don't have any, don't have questions, any questions yet, yet. but um, I, I guess I have, well, I'll wait until you talk about doing endoscopy. Okay, all right, we're gonna get there. We're gonna get there because we're gonna talk about anatomy and everybody's had this, uh, Miller's Anatomy from long ago. Um, and all the different saw, uh, places, pieces, and parts. Is there anything wrong with that? Am I blocking the top? Yeah, there we go. Is there anything wrong with that drawing? Was Miller wrong? A little bit hard to see. Let's blow it up a little bit. Now, anything wrong with this one? And I'll just cut to the chase. Uh, if I look carefully at that, and this is only the first time, you know, you look at something over and over, and this is the first time I really said, wait a sec, that's not right. Because that vocal cord curves upward. Vocal cords should be a straight line, taut. And we'll come back and see some examples of normals and abnormals, but that's what I saw abnormal in this case. So when we go to look, what kind of equipment have we got? This is a Storch uh, laryngoscope. No, it's not, uh, but they do make things that we're gonna use. Overhead light works if you can get in there. A laryngoscope with a long blade, long enough that you can hold the epiglottis down and not have it blocking half of the larynx. That's a common and huge problem that I see on cases that I'm shared with. Mouth gags are nice because they prevent it from biting down on you and also gives the people that are holding something to hold. If you put two mouth gags and you can hold the head very still and whatever anesthesia monitoring equipment that you're gonna need uh, oximetry, EKG, and so forth. Just the standard stuff, all right? As far as scopes, uh, flexible or rigid, most often I'm using a rigid scope, better documentation. Now we're talking about storage equipment potentially. And very, very critical, important things are to document it uh, by photos and ideally video. That requires a little bit more equipment, but you can hook it up uh, or at least videotape uh, that somehow to be able to see what's going on. The documentation uh, for capturing both and for those in practice, and I've spent 13, 14 years in two different specialty referral practices, big ones, and they had detailed written report. This is my selling point to the referring veterinarian and to the client. When my clients walked out the door, they had a fillable form that I was able to give them. This is just one example. This was a bronchoscopy. Just the different images, a couple of abnormalities, the cytology that I saw by the end of the day, I would have that read myself and put in there and I was able to do that. And they went home with something that they spent thousands of dollars for in their hands and then putting the CD together for the images and the referring veterinarian. So I encourage you to consider that just a fillable word document, talk to your grandkids or somebody that can do that for you because I can't. All right, so here we go, Dave, making it simple. The simple thing is that we need to minimize motion. 
And if you just anesthetize them and try to hold the mouth open and see things as they're trying to gag and swallow, we used to say, keep them light enough that they moved. But we want to look carefully at all the structures before they start moving or we give them drugs, Doprem, to move. So pre-med, whatever your flavor of the day is, uh, hook up your uh, oxygen, have an E2 tube ready, ECG, and then whatever your propofol or infloxone to induce them. And then once they are anesthetized and they're not moving around, you carefully look at the cartilages, saccules, the mucosa, whether there's any hyperemia, can you see the submucosal capillaries or not? Is the palate too long? What the tonsils look like and so forth? Now we're going to then go ahead and try to stimulate them with doxifram to try to you know, cause them to take a big breath and see whether or not there is any paresis. But just in case, you want to watch out that if this all turns to be normal after we give the dopram, many of these things will have same type of problems in their nasal pharynx or perhaps lower down the trachea. So be prepared, have equipment ready, and be yourself ready to look elsewhere. If the larynx turns out to be totally normal, they still made that striderous sound. They still were uh, exercise intolerant. So you need to be ready to look elsewhere, okay? So what does a normal one look like? All right, checking structures. We took the uh, problem before. We have the arytenoids here, the corniculate process, the cuneiform process, the epiglottis is ventral, very taut, straight vocal cords, saccules, glottic opening, trachea going down. Obviously, you've seen that a million times. What we want to do is be sure that the um, division, if you go ventral to dorsal here, that you have an equal volume, or if you want area under the curve, I'll refer to it later, uh, on both sides of that. We want to look to see, does it seem to be normal or not? It looks very equal to me here. And then finally, we're going to do something to make motion. So what does that look like in another case, all put together? Arytenoids are wide open with doxapram. On occasion, they will move back and forth, open and close, but they're wide open usually, and in this case, they are. You don't see the piriform recess where uh, food will be going before it's swallowed. You don't see the epiglottis, which is down here at six o'clock. Uh, we talked about the vocal cords, very taut. We do see nice subcapillary, submucosal capillaries here. There's no edema or infiltrates into the surface. Um, and you have to be able to visualize the entire glottic lumen. If you have the endoscope or your um, laryngoscope covering up the bottom half of the larynx here or the third of it, you've missed what might be the answer to the problem. So the whole thing needs to be seen and documented. Okay, everybody with me on that? Doxapram, dopram, doxapram uh, is the generic. I use one per pound. So I use 2.2 uh, mg per kg, one per pound really. And you can go lower, many people do. Regardless, if you give a lower dose, especially if you do that, and you don't see a good response, then repeat the dose. And you can do that within a few minutes. Uh, at 2.2, you're very unlikely to need to do that, but on occasion I've had, I've had to. The onset is pretty much immediate. The effect is showing a marked increase in inspiratory effort. And you have to be careful here, anticipate that they may lighten from almost any anesthetic you've used as they start to lighten up. So have that propofol handy or whatever you're using to be able to talk, uh, titrate a little bit higher. It'll last for a couple of minutes. Side effects uh, may be changes in heart rate or blood pressure, they're transient. You may feel if you hold on to their skull, a little fasciculation on occasion. I don't feel that very often of the skull muscle musculature. Um, in Canada, I was told that Dopram, Doxapram isn't available. Uh, Respiram is another manufacturer's name that I think is available in Canada. Uh, you might be able to, um, you might be able to get it that way. Dose recommendations, the only caution here is I found at least one source, um, unfortunately in VIN, and I think they've changed it, that went up to seven milligrams uh, per kilo in cats. Um, and that's way, way too high. When we gave and looked at flow volume on uh, pulmonary function testing, the one 
uh, one per pound, two per kg, was a very good 200, 250% increase in inspiratory flow. So it's a very good stimulation and you don't need to go much higher than that. Okay, so what does normal look like? Here we've got uh, a cat with a normal appearing larynx to me. It's symmetrical abduction, good opening of the larynx, taut vocal cords or what we call cords, they're not true cords. Mild edema maybe, there's a little bit glistening here, uh, maybe it's some mild edema and no secretions, so normal. What does abnormal look like? I think you all recognize that. A left-sided laryngeal paresis and paradoxical motion. So it's being pulled over. Uh, the right side is normal and opening up nicely. The left side is dynamic and abnormal uh, uh, abduction, okay? So it's collapse on that side, unilateral left laryngeal paralysis in a cat. What does a dog look like? Here's our normal dog. Uh, symmetrical opening again. This is one that I showed you before. Taut, straight cords, very taut, not thick. Uh, submucosal capillaries, you can see up here uh, along the uh, edge of the cuneiform process. Um, no secretions, all right? Nice, normal looking glottic opening. Abnormal, hyperemic. Uh, it's difficult to see or you have increased vascularity, submucosal here secretions down inside there. Now look, if you had covered up this portion of the uh, lumen, you would have missed this paradoxical cord um, problem on inspiration there and moving paradoxically inward. They should not be doing that. They should be nice and taut as shown in the left view, okay? So it's also a little bit of secretions, asymmetrical, they adducted cords. They're thickened and flaccid. Capillaries, not as easily or increased uh, hyperemia and few secretions down here. Not, not as bad as they can come. Give you some idea, all right? And if you draw that line, I think there's a subtle difference here. Uh, that left side maybe have a smaller area showing than on the right side, subtle, but it's there. If you could, certainly could miss that, you won't miss this if you look at the very ventral aspects of the glottic lumen. Okay, Dave said that, of course, there's gotta be these guys. So we look at their larynx and now you find out what's wrong. Overwhelmed, aren't you? I was when I saw this, okay? Here's our thing that we recognize, averted saccules. Here's that glottic opening. A lot of edematous, puffy looking tissue and proliferative tissue here, thickened tissue. Uh, really a disaster brachycephalic case. Not one that you want to encounter. Not one that I want to ever see again. Okay, so what does actually a video look like? So this is going to be uh, a dog. You take a look uh, at it. We'll try to let it start here. Dopram's been given. Just trying to watch what's going on. Oh, the right side there moved a little bit. I stopped it. I started again. Moving a little bit more. Good. Okay, now Ooh, come back. Sorry about that. Oh, we lost ourselves here. Let's go back. There we are. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, we'll just let it run all the way through. So right about now, doxapram kicks in. Nice taut cords, wide open. And occasionally, as I said, you will see the glottic opening uh, cords open and close not in this case, okay? All right, so what they look like at rest, what they look like stimulated in two different cases. And um, now I think I'm gonna leave Dave a question about those brachycephalics. <laughs> I got a couple of questions. Um, one was the first study you showed seemed to say that the left-sided left -sided paralysis was more common. What's the reason? The first one? Um, the first study you showed. No, they did not in that study. Um, uh, I don't think they actually looked at the numbers of which side uh, was more common. It's, it is more common on the left side. The reason the surgeons tie back the left side and they learned to do that was because in horses it almost always or I think always is the left side attributed to a, a long recurrent laryngeal nerve that goes to the left. 
but nobody knows that for certain or has documented in dogs that that's the case. The LARPARs in cats, um, for the most part that I recall, this is dangerous to ask me that, is uh, left, been left-sided, but I won't swear to that, okay? Okay. Uh, another question was the New, Le New Zealand study, is it accurate since they didn't use Dopram? Um, I think if anything, it would uh, show much more uh, numbers. <laughs> Uh, I didn't think it was, it was accurate in what they found. They had two separate observers uh, to look at the animals when they're induced, open their mouth, take a look at their larynx and make a comment about what's happening. And that was the numbers they came up to. And they had good intra observer agreement as to what they found. Um, I think they would have found more based on what they reported. If 62 uh, dogs out of that 250 had some degree of paresis, uh, I would be concerned that they would find a lot more with uh, giving doxapram. Okay, great. We have two people with the same question, and that is, what is your preferred pre-med protocol? Old school. Uh, so it was uh, 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 Valium uh, oftentimes, and uh, back in the thiopental days, no, we're doing uh, propofol. So just those two, propofol, um, could use uh, a narcotic and then a little propofol, but uh, main thing is whatever you're comfortable with, propofol is the one that I'm most comfortable and routinely use. Okay. Um, another question is, so you're saying that typically when you give Dopram, the vocal folds remain open rather than open and closed with respirations. Almost all of the ones that I have done, that is the case. Uh, some people tell me, and I don't see this or haven't seen it very often, that you will see it open and close, open and close with each breath. Um, we haven't talked about how to you know, know for sure which breath you're looking at, and I'll try to address that uh, as we get down the road. But um, I think most of the ones that I've encountered anyway, when you give that, maybe it's a dose related, open and close, maybe if uh, giving a one mig per kig instead of the 2.2 is what I give. Uh, maybe that turns into something that they still have open and closing uh, with a lower dose as possible. Uh, another question, what about the depth of anesthesia causing inadequate motion? And they uh, mentioned the Burbridge uh, study. Um, I don't have that one in front of me or on top of my tongue tip of my tongue. Um, I've never had one that's been too deep to respond to whatever the anesthetic was. So again, if it's a dose thing and giving uh, basically a half a mig per pound, I give a full mig per pound up to a maximum of three cc, 60 milligrams. So above 60 pound dog, I'm only still giving three cc's. Uh, another question is, do you evaluate the larynx in the induction phase? In Europe, they tend to examine in the recovery phase when the patient wakes up. Um, all the ones that I have done, um, I would say the majority of the ones far and away, the majority, 80 plus percent have been as they go under. Um, but I can see the value of that because they are under deep when you can pull the tube out, you can look at what's there, give the dopram and uh, reintubate to let them wake up after it's over. I can see the value in that too. Okay. Um, I think we'll stop there. We got a couple more questions, but we'll go on and we'll answer those in the next uh, break. Okay. All right. Um, so a quick uh, thing here, we're going to look at various disease examples um, and talk about them as we go through. Uh, we'll try to touch base on all of these. The first one is going to be mucosal edema, uh, shown here in this cat. Everything looks gelatinous. It's just mucosal edema. You've seen um, uh, pharyngeal mucoseals, things like that. You can very, pretty much tell that uh, you've got an edematous tissue. There's no fluid in this tissue. It's just edema. So it's thick tissue. And this guy was a Persian cat with stenotic nares. We did his nares and uh, things improved with a little bit of steroid and eventually off steroids altogether. You're gonna read more about brachycephalic cats coming up out of uh, 
Dr. Heidi Phillips in uh, University of Illinois, who's just finished a large study on brachycephalic cats and uh, the effects with their cardiologists on their heart and their airways and improvement at following surgery. So that's to come, It'd be exciting. Okay. All right, let's go down to laryngeal collapse. This, this guy we just saw, it's got laryngeal collapse. It's got all three stages that are called here. And that's an article out of uh, uh, Harm Leonard, who I met uh, down in uh, Salida, Colorado, uh, a veterinarian from the 50s and 60s who was adjunct professor at med schools out in Connecticut at Yale, I believe, uh, and wrote on the 50s, I think 57, the first uh, treatment for lateral uh, ventricles. Uh, and then this paper was on laryngeal collapse, as they called it. His paper, and people ought to pay attention here, talked about first, second, and third stage. And now people somewhere along the line converted that to grade one, grade two, grade three, which he never used in this original paper. Um, he was implying, I think, and maybe grade one, two, three implies a progression of severity of collapse. And I would say that that is the case in some, it is not the case in all. You can have third stage uh, total laryngeal collapse without seeing the first or second stage happening. So there's not really a progression, but let's talk about the, that first stage, uh, which is the um, saccular reversion, laryn laryngeal saccule. As you can see the vocal cords here, everybody has seen these routinely. Any brachycephalic that you've done, you've probably seen it. Uh, what you might want to look for is whether the cords look a little bit meatier, thicker, and whether the saccules have turned into a little tanner color, which I associate with more being a fibro fibrotic type of change. So a little more chronic. Which ones do you take out? I would take out these chronic ones. And depending, as we'll see in a second, sometimes owners will say, gee, he has a problem and I was going to call you. And then he seems fine. And these saccules, like your pants pockets that you put in the wash, uh, pop out in the dryer or in the washer, I don't know which, but they pop out. These can come and go. And if we look at that on uh, this guy, you'll see it happening. So they get, depending on his breathing, they pop out a little bit larger and then go back in place a little bit more. And that's what I think might be happening on some of these dogs where they say he's having a problem, that it's intermittent, that's a dynamic change. And I think about this as maybe the cause. Okay. All right, let's try to get on here. So the next, that would be the first stage that uh, Harm Leonard talked about. The cuneiform collapse uh, is the next stage. Uh, that looks something like this. So here's a pug and the little asterisks there are on the tips of the cuneiform process of the retinoid cartilages. Here's the corniculate above. So if you can't remember it, I always need the mnemonic of O comes before U. So it's top to bottom, uh, corniculate and cuneiform. I've got a Q-tip here trying to see where is that opening. Uh, that's a static view. We can look at a, another pug. This is a different pug, believe it or not, having the same sort of problem. Now we can see a glottic opening, vocal cords showing up here, uh, saccules at the bottom, needing a new, apparently a new lamp being replaced. But here are these uh, cuneiform uh, cartilages that are scissoring across the front and collapsing. I'll play it at full speed, uh, just the normal breathing, and then I slowed it down in the next little video to really appreciate what happens. These cross enough that they obstruct enough that the entire larynx collapses. So let's take a look. That's half speed. We want to go back. We'll just go to half speed. Okay, half speed. So they get sucked in and obstruct. And the glock, you can see everything is being pulled backwards and obstructing. Okay. So this is just a little pug. You know, AKC says 16 to 18 is a normal pug. 34 pound pug is a chunk and getting weight off of them, but also in this case, we were able to do a partial laryngectomy uh, of these tips of the uh, cuneiform processes. Okay. 
The last one is the curriculate uh, collapse, um, third stage uh, that he called it, grade three that uh, people are talking about now, and I'm wondering who, who made that change. But the third stage of our severe, that was what his paper back in 1960 was all about. Uh, uh, if we look back to this, this is the article that people were talking about. Um, they said the left side there, this was the left again, that's what people were talking about. So it did seem to be both more. I have seen just a right side, but I would say most of what I see is left side. They talked about paresis. Uh, I think they really mean paresis and paralysis. Uh, we could argue about this being not moving quite right. I had one where I drew the line, dorsal to ventral, and there was a slight difference. Maybe that's what they were talking about, but I would call these for certain laryngeal paralysis. Okay, so looking at those, you can see that and the difference that down the middle here. So these normal, obviously no problem here. This guy can barely breathe on inspiration. He's squeaking, doing that. And there's a subtle difference here. Maybe you'd call this side weak. Maybe if we've looked at it a little different later, he turned into this, we don't know. Okay. All right, so what do you see in this case? Think about it. All right, so it's bilateral. Oh, we lost a slide here. What do we see of that inspection? Not gonna see it, all right, we're just gonna play it. What I'm seeing is a very thick mucosa. I don't see submucosal capillaries. These are little ridges of uh, inflamed tissue. These capillaries are probably on the epiglottis. We've got secretions in the lumen down here. Cords look a little bit thickened, maybe, not sure. Uh, the lumen is at this image, so still shot, uh, not doing much of anything. So we're gonna give doxapram, I want you to watch the cords. I'm gonna make the sound that occurs when these dogs breathe in and when they breathe out, and you're gonna see what causes the fluttering sound on those cords. Okay, so here we go. You can tell inspiration by seeing the whole larynx move caudally and secretions move inward. So they're closing now, beginning to get worse, starting to make noise. All right, that's all the sound you get from me. All right, so that fluttering sound very often they'll come in before they get to the striderous point and have that sound just walking down the hallway and you can see him and say, that dog's got early LARPAR probably. I can't confirm that. I haven't taken those dogs and say, I'm gonna scope you right now, let's find out because they came in for another reason. But if you hear that fluttering sound, I'd be suspicious at least if they're striderous with any stress that gets back to doing the stress test, the walk test to document whether they have exertional strider or not, that's important. Have them walk the dog when they have exercise intolerance. And listen to them when they just walk back in the front door. Do they have strider at that point? Okay. Um, not going to talk about uh, gulp. Uh, we know what that is. There's a great website that talks about various things for owners and veterinarians to be able to uh, rehab therapy, referring how to do these tests and things. So. The geriatric onset laryngeal paralysis polyneuropathy gulp is a really, it should be G-U-L-P, it's a mouthful. Okay, what do you see on this cat? We know it's a cat, initial inspection. It's gonna be a unilateral paralysis, the one that we had the still images of before. Again, left-sided, Dave. Okay, paradoxical motions uh, of that going across the right side opening pulling the left side across, that Bernoulli effect. That's why planes fly right there, that's why planes fly. Okay, that one we do, I, uh, I have done in a couple of cases, a unilateral, these are two different cases, unilateral uh, uh, retinoidectomy, laser procedure. Others have done tiebacks, uh, we're never doing bilateral tiebacks. Some have tried the splitting of the larynx down below, and trying to take out the uh, portions of it, but uh, this is the what I've done, my cases. All right, I talked about your hands. You're moving your fingers. Uh, you can feel things. Does the larynx, the pharynx know that you have to do something? 
Uh, and that's one thing I want to talk about. So here's a case that we had. And what do you see on this guy? Lots of secretions going all the way trailing down into the trachea and a thick flaccid looking vocal cords. I don't see submucosal vessels. And we're going to stimulate now with doxapram. And what I'm going to do is go down into the trachea. And what I'll discover is that the secretions tail off. So all these secretions are oral saliva being aspirated, eliciting coughing probably. I have a dog you may have just heard in the distance that has a problem with this that we've scoped a couple of times once when she choked as a puppy and then just last November uh, here in Georgia to check to see if there's anything else going on. And she has secretions that build up and gags and coughs and probably something similar to this. So here you go. Thick cords down the trachea, just the cervical trachea and tailing off in the distance and then should be coming back up. Also tracheal ligament. Now the doxapram, I'm gonna stop that. You've got tight cords on the right side, a cord on the right side and a tight cord, but thickened and a little bit maybe almost bruised here on the left side. So what's going on here? Um, we've got uh, secretions, edema, thick flaccid cords, and uh, the dog is not having trouble breathing. He is not exercise intolerant, but it does have a problem with sensation, swallowing mechanism, something going on. I don't know what the result is. I tried to talk to Anja Venker van Hagen from Utrecht at one point as to how to test for this. And other than putting your fingers down here, is there a strong reflex? Uh, it's kind of hard to sense anything. There's no real good test for that that I'm aware of, okay? So is it a motor or a sensory defect? Um, I think in this case, we've got a motor to a degree because we have flaccid cords at rest. Uh, this one is abnormal anatomy, but also a sensory problem. He's aspirating uh, secretions. Pharyngeal, laryngeal, somewhere in there, there's an issue. Okay. Uh, laryngeal granulomas will occur. Uh, on occasion, you'll see these. They're called kissing lesions sometimes. They happen in uh, singers, uh, dogs that bark too much. I don't know what the cause is for sure in them, but they're not, uh, they're benign. They're not difficult to remove uh, either sharp or with laser to ablate the, uh, uh, the end of it. I would use a diode laser rather than a CO2 uh, for penetration reasons. Um, let me go back to that. Um, and so you may see these guys, they may be bigger than that, uh, but this is a pretty good size one. Um, I don't know if this case actually had the owner aware of a problem or not. I can't remember if uh, that was the case. All right, laryngeal webs. Owners definitely are gonna know about these guys. Uh, the first one that we had a series of these, believe it or not, I think we had four altogether in the spring of what year was that, 17, 18, um, that came to Illinois. One was up from uh, a good veterinarian in Albuquerque. Um, and this was the dog that we saw. It It was a rescue dog that came from California. The woman brought it back and noticed that the dog just tired almost immediately with any exertion. Um, this was an endotracheal tube with a foil around it because we were gonna be lasering. You can see the results opening up and how much of that glottic lumen was open. Uh, by just doing that. That was our one dog. And that was uh, four, three to four years ago. The dog is running like crazy. He's doing well now. I had been doing well. We had to redo the dog one time. Uh, and the second time around, we ended up using uh, mitomycin C to be able to inhibit scar tissue reformation. And that's worked out. This is another dog that I actually read about um, Tobias when we published it in the local newspaper in Champaign. Um, and these people said, well, my dog makes a funny sound. Why don't you take a look? And so we did. And this is the whole glottic lumen with a web in the front down to the ventral aspect. And this was immediately post-surgery. And this was then three months later with the healing that occurred wide open. This dog also had mitomycin. We recommend the use of that if you're into doing webbings, uh, taking those off. Uh, just with a diode laser, okay? 
The last one that we'll talk about quickly is Norwich Terriers. Um, Norwich, you may have seen the article from uh, Lindell Johnson uh, looking at them. The original work was done uh, actually when she was in her residency at Illinois. We had a Norwich that was imported from England uh, into Chicago area, came down and had what we now know was this problem. We didn't know that at the time. This was published in 17. Uh, a series of cases that she looked at, I think were 16 cases. And you're, what you're looking at here is more of a keyhole shaped uh, glottic opening. Uh, this was described out of a large series uh, uh, of uh, Bern, Switzerland, uh, 200 some dogs, I believe. But unfortunately it's all in uh, high German and <laughs> not uh, intelligible to uh, myself or many others, uh, unfortunately, because of our inability to speak multiple language. Uh, so that was uh, one of some of the dogs would show up like that. Others had a tremendous inflammatory response, edema of the tissues above the glottic opening. Um, and uh, you can see the Q-tip here into the glottic lumen. And the retinoids are just uh, demis as all get out, epiglottis down below, left side here, okay? So uh, redundant suprarytenoid uh, tissue, laryngeal collapse would occur because of the, like that last case I was just showing, averted saccules and a narrowed abnormally shaped uh, laryngeal opening in 14 of these 16 dogs that were looked at. 12 were scoped for problems, four were scoped out of interest. And I think it was two or three of the ones that had no problems, uh, according to owners, were found to have problems when they were scoped, so 14 out of the 16 total, okay? Uh, the advice was to be prepared with these dogs. If you're doing uh, Norwiches, have some smaller tubes handy because you may not be able to get a normal size tube for that size dog uh, and need something smaller, so be prepared, okay? All right, last is uh, uh, hopefully least that we'll have to worry about neoplasia. Here's a real quick one, weird one, only one that I've seen. This is actually a thyroid tumor that kind of pushed its way up the neck and obstructed the larynx. Uh, a more typical case might be your cat with a lymphoma uh, and the very typical swelling. So I would definitely biopsy something like this and try to take a look at it. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma is another uh, more common one. Lymphoma probably then squam. Thyroid uh, is not the most common. Uh, these other two are the much more common. Okay, so back to where I missed being, and that was on the beach outside of uh, uh, where I lived in Oregon, and uh, ask if you have any final questions, but also put up for the third time uh, and the last time that you'll see it, but it's available, what you should be looking for, all the way to the ventral aspect of a glottic lumen, to the dorsal aspect uh, between the arytenoids. And then looking uh, in between uh, the area under the curve, whether the cords are taut, whether they move appropriately, whether they have a response to dopram. So back to you, Dave. Okay, Brendan, we got uh, a number of questions. And um, in regarding the evaluation being the gold standard of the larynx, Radinsky um, concluded that nasal or, or transnasal laryngoscopy did not improve the evaluation of laryngeal function compared to just uh, laryngoscopy per os. What do you think about that? Um, have you ever done uh, transnasal? The only transnasal work that I've done with a scope is really after we've done the late procedure, the laser-assisted turbinectomy and removed brachycephalic aberrant turbinates in the front and the back of the nose, and then we can see all the way through. Uh, but that was not to visualize the larynx, that was to make a patent opening in the brachycephalics. Um, that sounds like a research paper. I don't know many people that evaluate the larynx by trying to pass something through the nose, uh, personally. Okay, um, here's one. If the vocal cords adduct when the arytenoids AB duct normally on inspiration, do you call this laryngeal paralysis? In people, it's called laryngeal fold dysfunction, and most people would not call this laryngeal paralysis in dogs. I tend to think that this causes signs, and do you classify differently 
uh, from GLOP? Um, well, I wouldn't call it a, uh, the GLOP uh, because you're not having total laryngeal collapse. Those are the dogs that really you know, fall into that category, I think. Uh, I do think there is a deficit in the innervation to the vocal cords when you see that. And I showed you some images of that. Um, but I wouldn't, uh, I think that dog is maybe in route to. Uh, we see the end result of a total collapse and we don't really know the progression. Uh, does it start in some cases with paresis of the vocal cords giving you that a deduction uh, on inspiration and then later affect other uh, innervation sites and total collapse, I don't know. Okay. Uh, another question is, um, is the webbing caused from debarking? Um, one, uh, one or two of the uh, dogs that we had were, this dog that I showed you with the tube, the first one, was a debarking dog, yes. Um, Shelties in many cases were routinely told to be debarked back in, back in the day. Um, and I think we probably saw some way back when. Um, I had a Malamute friend that had a dog that uh, webbed and had been debarked. It was one of those that get rid of your dog because he barks. And the only thing at the time, and maybe on rare occasions we still do, is a debarking procedure. But there is a way to debark on the upper aspect of the vocal cords without going, you see the image in front of you, uh, if it's still showing, the ventral aspect of the larynx. They web because you go too far down on a debarking procedure and you have raw tissue that's opposing the scars and it's under tension as the larynx opens and closes. And so it builds up and up and up and up until it's able to stabilize the larynx under tissue under pressure. Um, so I'm not sure if I answered that or not, Dave, did I? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think so, thanks. Uh, do you advocate using Dopram in canine neonatal resuscitation? Um, it, that's one of the main uses for it, yes, but it's not used for, for the purpose that we're talking about. Um, and I, being a nose person and far from the uh, uh, birth canal, have never done that personally. <laughs> okay. Um, have you recognized spasmodic dysphonia in dogs? Uh, have I recognized? No, I cannot say that I have. Okay. Um, I don't know if there was more questions about that, but um, um, that was the final question. I guess I do have one question, and that is regards back to your favorite, the brachiocephalic dogs with the inverted saccules. Uh -huh. um, there's a little controversy, I think, sometimes with our surgeons in the fact that they believe if we take care of the rest of the respiratory problems that the averted saccules will atrophy back on down and they don't need to be removed. Um, I guess I'm somewhat of the thought that some of these dogs have so much obstruction of their airway that it gets them to recover faster. Just your thoughts. Yeah. I uh, in practice, when I was, uh, I'm a big stickler that I think uh, endoscopists and surgeons are in the same area. And I do not want to see a dog, that very severe brachycephalic case that I showed that barely could find a glottic opening, had been, it was an 18-month-old, uh, I believe, uh, dog that came in that had gotten acutely worse. And it had been spayed at six months. The problem was at six months they should have done, and I'm a firm believer that you should fix the fixable at that early age. And that's at least the nostrils, and there's a different procedure that's on the horizon that's coming out that is a much better nostril procedure than the 1949 published Trader procedure. Um, and that should be coming out. Um, the cats that I'm telling told you about and the dogs that we were doing at Illinois uh, are using this new procedure. Uh, a much better uh, nostril uh, improvement. But um, where were we going with that, Dave? I guess just the averted saccules removing yeah. them. Uh, so in doing these, I would uh, look, scope, 
decide what needs to be done and do it. And so the surgeons that I worked with in both Denver and Oregon, uh, I did the surgery. Uh, if the palate needed to be done, um, I would do some of those and they would do some of them as well. But the palate done, the nostrils done, and uh, the saccules, if they looked like they were chronic and more fibrotic to the touch even, uh, I definitely would take those. Um, if I was on, you know, in between, I would tell the owner we did the uh, palate and the nostrils and I wasn't sure. I think with rest and recovery, you may be okay. Uh, if not, we can always come back. And I did that sometimes as well. Uh, I agree that sometimes that palate and the nostrils are sufficient, but not always. It depends as a judgment call. Yeah. Yeah, I guess there was one comment um, that a European paper showed that they did not regress over time. Um, okay, and I've seen some that I've had to come back and do. So I would, you know, certainly can agree with that. Um, I have numbers to look at and be curious to look at that paper. But um, definitely there is the other paper that shows that if you do the routine old, old procedures, whatever you're shortening the palate procedure, not necessarily a folded palatoplasty, uh, the uh, nostrils uh, and maybe the saccules, that subsequent anesthetic episodes for that animal have something like above an 80% less um, likelihood of developing recovery anesthetic related issues. So even just doing those slight improvements of routine palate shortening, not the palatoplasty, routine nasal web, nasal uh, wedge surgery, whatever you're doing at the nose, maybe saccules is enough to minimize future risks to a great degree. Yeah, so what age would you recommend doing uh, the fixable, fixing the fixable in the brachiocephalic? Uh, neutered at the time they're neutered. Uh, if I got a dog, they would come in with problems and when I was in practice uh, and we were going to scope them to do something at the time, I would talk to the referring vet and say, you know, I don't like to take procedures from you but if the dog needs to be spayed or neutered or whatever, and we're doing the airway, we should do that here and lower the risk of anesthesia. And never, never had anyone say, sure, do that. It's safer for the patient. Okay. Um, how frequently do you combine fluoroscopy with laryngoscopy for dogs that have ep epiglottal entrapment? And what's your preferred means of assessing this? Uh, good. That's a good question because um, I've not uh, done fluoro for the dogs or at a pos position that I could do that. Did not have that in practice, either practice at the time. Um, and did have it at the university for you know close to 30 years. It was there ancient at one time, but better later. Uh, but I didn't really look at those cases in that regard. But I think that would be something uh, that would be worth looking at. The question is, are they having the entrapment at the time or not? Can you induce it or not? Okay. Uh, do you prefer a partial retinoidectomy or a tie back with laryngeal paralysis in cats? In cats? Yeah. And I was doing it at the time myself. Uh, so if I documented it, I did it. Um, it's, I don't do tie backs. They don't let me do threads and things like that for sewing. Um, I can use an instrument with a laser, a rare scalpel, um, but nothing on a suture line. Okay. Uh, do you see laryngeal uh, granulomas after averted saccule surgery? I, I wouldn't call it the same as the laryngeal granuloma that I showed. Granulation tissue in that area uh, from getting scar tissue, yes, I've seen that on occasion. And I guess the last question is, can you just briefly describe this new NARES uh, surgical procedure? No. Okay. <laughs> um, it is uh, a much deeper uh, uh, amputation of a portion of that wing. Okay. Okay, well, Brendan, that uh, is the last of the questions. We had great attendance. And um, just to remind everybody that these, this video uh, webinar is available free to anyone. 
at any time by going to endoscopy talk. So Brendan, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. More than welcome, uh, everybody. Please, please stay safe. Okay. Uh, the next webinar uh, will be uh, from Dr. Dennis Verdvelgen, and he's an equine surgeon from Sydney School of uh, Veterinary Sciences in Australia. And he'll be talking about uh, understanding equine oral endoscopy. This is a revolutionary way of um, uncovering oral pathology in the equine. Uh, so certainly pass this on to those interested in equine medicine and surgery. Uh, we will be taking a short hiatus in our webinars and this next webinar will be December 9th at 8 p.m. That's New York time. And remember all these past talks are available again at endoscopytalks.com. So wishing you all the very best and uh, good health and in these challenging times. So thank you very much. <laughs>